What a beautiful day the Lord has, uh, has given us. Let's uh, join together, please, in, in prayer. Almighty God, grant to your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name abide until the end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we studied last week from uh, chapter 2 of, of 1 John, and we took a look at, at two different aspects of our walk in faith. We took a look at obedience, and we took a look at love. That love theme is going to keep uh, recircling through as we look at 1st, 2nd, and, and 3rd John. And we saw last week how John also issued some, some warnings. Um, first, it's the warning that we can't love both God and the world. We can't love God and the world. He also talked about the Antichrist. And we talked last week about how in the Lutheran confessional writings, our doctrinal writings, the Antichrist is revealed as the papacy. Um, it's not the individual men that hold the office, but it is the office itself. You see, if it was individual men that was identified as the Antichrist, when they would die, then the Antichrist would go away. So Lutherans historically and confessionally have understood the Antichrist as the office of the papacy. It has uh, all of the marks, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, all the marks of the Antichrist. Lutherans, by the way, aren't alone in that assessment. We are not an island on that. When you look, for example, at Calvin, uh, the founder of uh, uh, the roots of Presbyterianism, when you look at Wesley, uh, the roots of Methodism, when you look at Knox, when you look at uh, Anglican uh, reformers, um, that is the historic position of the church that the Antichrist is identifiable and the Antichrist is the uh, historic uh, papacy. We also talked about how John highlights Antichrists with a, with a small letter uh, A, and that's anything that deviates from the apostolic gospel, anything that deviates. And so we started to look at what was being denied and what he highlights. For example, denial of the Incarnation, denial of the divinity of Christ, denial of the Father and the Son, the denial of the Son and not having the Father. We talked about how we relate that to um, the really prevalent belief in many quarters that uh, whatever religion you come from, we're all worshiping the same God. The scripture is very clear. If, if, if you deny the Son, if you deny that Jesus is, is the Messiah, you do not have the have the Father. So we look at, looked at various aspects of when he was getting into um, Antichrist. And uh, to conclude last week, let's pick up in chapter 2, verse 19 of 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 19 of 1 John. And there John writes, They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. False teaching gives rise to discord and division. It gives rise to a departure from the pure um, gospel. That's why, why you'll, you'll hear in John's writings, you, you hear it throughout Scripture, of the, of the seriousness associated with, with false teaching and why it is, it is so very important to be correct in the teaching. Um, we live in an ever-growing age in which people see a great fluidity amongst, amongst churches where whatever denominational label might be or might not be upon a church, we're, we're seeing a day, and it's, it's increasing all the time, 
uh, in, in which people will look and say, um, well, we're, we're going to go from this to, to this. Or from here to, to here. Even though there's, there's profound theological differences. I mean, profound theological differences. I was just talking uh, yesterday with, with someone and, and they were talking about that, how they had seen a friend go from this particular denomination to a, to a non-denominational and, and, it's, and it's fundamentally uh, different in so many uh, aspects. Um, that's why, um, now I've, I've, been, I've been preaching and teaching this for, for a while, the thing to choose when you're looking for a church is what does the church teach? What does it teach? Program and all that kind of stuff, fellowship opportunities, I don't want to minimize that, but that is so secondary to what is it that you teach? Because you want to be fed that which is true. You want your children and your grandchildren to be fed that which is true. And in today's world, there's an incredible temptation to simply say, oh, we, we go, to this, go to this church or this church. Why? Well, that's the, that's the church closest to us. Or, um, oh, we've got some friends that go to, to that church. Um, do you, and you start to hear that being given the reason as opposed to what is it that you teach. I'll tell you one thing that really energizes me. It's when people that visit the congregation they say, you know, we'd love to sit down with you. And they've got a whole list of theological questions. I mean, that's like a candy store, isn't it? I mean, that's like Christmas morning. Sitting there and they're going down their list of theological questions. And I love it. I love it. And I, and I say, you know, whether the Lord leads you to this congregation or not, that's, that's, the, that's the, Lord's, the Lord's business here. But the way you're going about it is exactly right exactly right so we see john elevate here the importance of uh, of doctrine let's go on into verse 26 of of chapter 2 there he says i write things these things to you concerning those who would deceive you as for you the anointing that you received from him abides in you and so you do not need anyone to teach you but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie and just as taught you abide in him every believer is anointed by the holy spirit the holy spirit takes up residence in us in our in our baptism and what john is saying is you you, you don't have a need for anyone to teach you what he's getting at remember the background of this is the heresy of gnosticism and the false teachers that were saying you are saved by a special knowledge with God, very mystical type of, type of understanding. And, and John's saying, you, you don't need any of that kind of, kind of false teaching. What you have is you have the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, who uses the word to teach. Remember, there's no such thing as a wordless spirit. The word is always attached to the word. And so there's never a sense in which God, God told me with regard to this which I believe, which is antithetical to the, the scripture. The Holy Spirit is always attached to the, the word. Um, th there was a group in which, in which uh, Luther was... was uh, was uh, just railing about in terms of they, they believe that they had they had had the holy spirit and 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 all of these special teachings that they had and, and luther said they believe that they've uh, swallowed the holy spirit feathers and all <laughs> is, is how he is how he put it what he was getting at is you don't have an understanding of of god the spirit doesn't communicate apart from the word there's no such thing as the wordless spirit. So John's saying you don't need false teachers to, uh, to teach you. Okay, let's swing in now into uh, chapter, chapter three. And we're going to look at one of the most beautiful designations that is ours um, through our baptism into Christ and that is being a child of God. And there are various characteristics of being a child of God that John highlights. First, 
is righteous. Righteous. Now, <clears throat> being claimed in the waters of baptism as God comes and, and washes us in his promises, he, he makes us righteous. But John is also getting at this understanding of living out that which is righteous or that which is, is right. So let's go to chapter 2. We'll pick up, I'm sorry, we're still finishing up chapter 2. Verse 28 of chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he's revealed we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born of him. Unrighteous conduct, then, doing that which is, which is not right in the eyes of God is, is unthinkable, then, for the Christian. Now, that doesn't mean that we do right all the time. We're not sinless. But to live out that life which is pleasing to God as we anticipate his second coming, that is the desire that God plants uh, in us. A person's righteousness is is evident of the new birth it's not the cause of the new birth so so as god manifests that which is pleasing to him through us that's evidence of the indwelling spirit in us that's evidence of god working through word and sacrament and and birthing that in us the gnostics said the heretics said that righteousness not knowledge is the mark of the regenerate. No. A mark of the one who has been regenerated through Christ is that which is pleasing unto God. A second aspect of being a child of God, to put it in shorthand, not known. Not known. Now what do I mean by that? Let's go to uh, chapter 3, verse 1. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That word there, know, it means realizing the significance of something. The world did not realize... Uh, John, the first chapter, Gospel of John, the world did not realize the significance of Jesus Christ because the world did not realize the significance of Christ. As followers of Christ, we can then expect to be treated in the same manner. Take a look, please, at uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John, chapter 15. We'll pick up in verse 18. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So a child of God means then we have a desire to do that which is right, born of God. It means... That just as the world did not understand who Jesus is, so also with us, the world will hate us when we come up against the ways of the world. The third aspect of being a child of God that John highlights is we'll be like him. Is we'll be like him. Let's go on into uh, verse 2 of chapter 3. Beloved, we're God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he's revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We will all have resurrected bodies. All have resurrected bodies. Real physical bodies then. 
that uh, we will live forever with God in heaven. As I mentioned in past classes uh, a, while, a while ago, um, some people will say, exactly how old will I be in heaven? <laughs> and, and then, and I've, and I've heard it, because, and, and people, people then will have an age when they ask that question. They'll say, because 27 was great. <laughs> if, I, if I could be 27, well, we, we don't know the answer, answer to that, but we do know that we will have flesh and body. We will be like him. Let's go on into verse 3. And here we have John highlighting purified and purify. What, is, what do we mean by that? John chapter 3, verse 3. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We'll jump over to chapter 1, verse 7. And we read, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. We've, we've already been purified through the blood of Christ. But the Christian also is to purify themselves, that's what John is talking about, in terms of living out this reality of who we are. Now we're really a corollary of, of the righteous here as we live out the life in terms of, of turning away from sin. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't turn there, but let me just give you a couple of examples. You can maybe put in the margins on this. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 1 Timothy 5, 22. James 4, 8. 1 Peter 1, 22. All examples of the same point that John is making here. John now turns to amplify what he's talking about in terms of this turning away from, from sin. Let's pick up in verse 4. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. Well, this section catches our attention now, doesn't it? So, what's he talking about? The very first part there, verse 4, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Scripture gives us various definitions of, of sin in, in Scripture, it, it missing the mark, iniquity. Here it's described as, uh, as lawlessness as lawlessness. Verse, verse 6. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. What John is getting at in this section is deliberate, habitual sinning. John is going to be the first to say we are all sinners um, and this old Adam and old Eve and us do not depart uh, from us until the Lord takes us home. He's going to be the first to say that. The issue he's getting at here is deliberate, habitual sinning. See, John's not talking about the issue of somehow becoming perfect here or our redemption based upon what it is that we do. John is battling indifference 
to sin and its seriousness. Now remember, in Gnosticism, what, what you had was, you had an emphasis in terms of, of uh, harshness upon the body because the body was looked at as evil. You also had, in Gnosticism, an emphasis on licentiousness. So John here is getting at the, that the point that sin and Christ are, are irreconcilably opposed to each other. Or to put it another way, unrepentance kills faith. Unrepentance kills faith. Our doctrinal writings is, is, is so clear, echoing scripture on this. And so then you get into the portions of scripture where you see if, if a brother or sister is, is uh, caught in sin, in other words, if there's no repentance of that, um, we then need to confront uh, that person in a spirit of gentleness with the understanding that we too are, are sinners for the purpose of that by the grace of God they may come to repentance. The temptation that you see also growing in various quarters of the church is a compartmentalization with regard to understanding of the comprehensiveness of sin and also our uh, individual walks. What I mean by that is people comfortable in the pews while at the same time knowingly know that they're in a state of unrepentance with regard to sin. And, and compartmentalizing those two to where it's also expressed in, in uh, well, I, I know the... I know the scripture says that, but. I know the scripture says that, but. You see, that then is, is saying we can continue in habitual sin here while at the same time as not having repentance in that area, that at the same time then coming to receive the sacrament when there is no repentance. Remember, Scripture says the one thing that should keep you away from the sacrament is not sin. Because if sin kept us away from the reception of the sacrament, then none of us would ever come, right? <laughs> We'd come to the party, be very awkward every week, right? We'd all, you'd say, come for all has been made ready. Well, all has been made ready, but we can't because we're sinners. See, if sin keeps us from the sacrament, then, then, then we're all we're all in trouble. But the one thing scripture says to keep us away from the sacrament is unrepentance. That's the issue that John is getting at here. It is indifference toward sin. That's what he's getting at. Okay. John adds to this list now. He adds to it love. So by the grace of God, we want to live the righteous life we're, we're not going to be known by, by the world. The world, there's immediate conflict in that because of the ways of the world and the ways of, of God. We'll be like him. We'll have the resurrected body. We're purified through Christ, but we're also to lay aside by the strength of God's sin. We're to fight um, against, that, against that. We are not to be indifferent with regard to our, to our sin. We are to hope that there are fellow Christians that will love us enough that if we're caught in unrepentance to confront us with that, that's maturity in the body of Christ, right? When you say, I, I love you this much that, that I want to talk with you uh, about that um, and approaching in the spirit of gentleness. He now adds the subject of, of love. You'll notice John writes differently than the, than the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul is very linear in his writing. He goes from A to B to C. It's very logical. John, John comes along here. And, and remember, um, the Holy Spirit inspires all the words, but the Holy Spirit did not violate the personalities of the various writers. That, that's why you see the, the differences uh, in them. And so John comes, so Paul is bump, bump, bump. You know, very, very logical, A, B, C. John comes along and he'll talk about a subject He'll talk about another subject. He'll talk about another subject. And he goes, oh, I got more to say about this again. And so then he'll loop back here. And he goes, oh, I got more to say about this too. And, and you'll see kind of these loops 
like, like this. That's just a characteristic of, uh, of, of John. So now he loops back to the topic of love. So he's going to come and uh, fill that out uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more. Let's go to chapter 3, verse uh, 11. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So now, now he's back, uh, back on this. So he's, he's amplifying now this, this section of the purified and purify. He, he's going he's gonna to come off of this now and he's going to go back to the love uh, emphasis. And then he gives an example. We must not be like Cain, who is from the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. So Cain here is, is held up as, the, as the, the prototype of those who, of those who hate and those who, who, uh, who murder. <clears throat> And the call then is to not be like them. In other words, to, um, to love. Now notice in... Um, uh, verse... Uh, I, got, I got the wrong verse. Let me find it. 12. We must not be like Cain, who is from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And now, he's, now he's looping back to this understanding that the world, world's, world's not going to know you. And that conflict with the world can be when the righteousness of God is manifest against a world that sees a difference in righteousness and, and then there's immediate conflict because they don't like they don't like their righteousness when compared to their own belief, belief system. Um, John is saying, don't, don't be like this. Don't, don't be like uh, Cain here. Don't be like one who, who murders his, uh, who's his, uh, his brother here. Then we get to the because. Verse 14. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have life, eternal life, abiding in them. Because here then gives the reason why believers know that we have passed from death to life. It doesn't give the reason for the redemption. In other words... We look at our own lives and we see by the grace of great God's grace being manifest in us that all is God's ways of testifying to the truth of his work in our lives. You don't want to examine your life and then say, I must be a believer because of this. That's, that's dangerous. However, one can look at one's own life and know confidently that God will produce that which is pleasing to him through me. And so you, you, you've, got, you've got some theological looks where to the answer of the question, well, how do I know I, I really believe? They will say, well, look at your life. You understand the danger of that, right? Because as we look at our life, we'll say, well, I can see some some good or some, I guess, righteous things coming, but, but you also don't know what's kind of going on inside <laughs> and, and the sinfulness. The, the Lutheran understanding is God called you his own in the waters of baptism and made his decision about you. You see, that roots it then on God's action and then a thankfulness that God will produce that life in us that is pleasing unto, unto him. Verse 16. We, uh, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, 
and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Verse 18, little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. Now remember, you let Scripture interpret Scripture, because what did we talk about a couple of weeks ago? The importance of verbal proclamation, right? Right? So you look at that, and what does Scripture tell us? It's two truths. How do we witness? We witness verbally, and how do we witness? We, we witness through our actions. It, it, that's not one, choose one, A or B, that is, that is both, right? That we witness to Christ in word and in action. The great theologian, Charlie Brown, put it this way. I love the human race. It's people I can't stand. I love the human race. It's people I can't stand. And so for those that particularly are challenging in your life, or for those what uh, the late author Joyce Landorf described in, in her books as irregular people in your lives, for the irregular people in your lives, or those that, that you perhaps struggle a little bit more to, to love, where do our eyes turn? But our eyes turn to the one who loves us for the sinner we are. And then we look at each other as fellow sinners, far short of being who Christ wants us to be, but we're all works in progress as God is at work in our lives each and every day. And he won't be finished until we draw our last breath and he takes us home. God's always at work transforming us and molding us into the person that he wants us to be. Verse 17, again, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Love is then the willingness to surrender something that has value for your own life in order to enrich the other. It is saying, how can I serve the other? It is the mindset every morning by the grace of God when we wake up and we say, Lord, you have placed me on the earth to bring you glory and to serve others, so how can I serve others instead of the expectation when our feet hit the floor of, I wonder who's going to serve me today. I wonder who's going to make my life better today. I wonder about that. Because when we, when we live that way, with the inward turn we will always be dis disappointed because the world will never, ever be able to serve you up to the expectations that you will continually, risingly have each and every day. Because if there's a level of service that's here, then tomorrow it better be here, right? Instead, God says, I have redeemed you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ you are my servants. You bring me glory by serving others. And so we hit the day with saying, how is it that I can serve the people that I come into contact with? How, how is it that I can encourage them in the Lord? How is it that I can live out my faith in word and in deed, even those people that I love the human race, it's the people I can't stand kind of people, right? The irregular people in our lives that we struggle. How can I love them? That's where John's going. He's right back at the understanding of love. <clears throat> Verse 19 by this we will know that we're from the truth and we'll reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God's greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. 
The by this here is that self-sacrificing love of God. That as we look and we say, Lord, you desire righteousness in us and you will, you will birth that. Lord, you will strengthen us as we walk against a world that goes the other way when we walk as disciples of Christ. They hated you, they're gonna hate us. <laughs> but we live in the confidence that there's only an audience of one, only an audience of one each and every day. And the world, world is, isn't gonna understand the significance of that, but we're gonna bring light into, into the world. We always look each and every day with our eyes towards heaven. Uh, the spirituals, uh, it's just incredible. When you listen to spirituals, it's so heavenly focused, so many spirituals. That's a good reminder for us that, that this, isn't the, this isn't the stopping point. Sinful human, humankind is not the stopping point. Um, and, and, and as one sees sin rampant in, in, in the world, our homeland is in heaven. We're called to bring light Here's our purpose. We're going to go out and we're going to, to serve. We've been purified by the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to set aside our sin and we want to love. Not with broad statements of I love humanity, but I love even that person. And how can I love them and bring glory to God. That's a life well lived, isn't it? And that's what God produces in us to where we can look at ourselves and we see the sinner that we are, but we look unto him confident in who he will birth in us each and every day as we are set forth to serve. Well, next week we're going to continue on into uh, chapter four, incredible chapter of 1 John. We'll continue next week.